On February 13, 2017, two best friends, Abigail Williams and Liberty German, embarked on a hike together on the Monon High Bridge in Delphi, Indiana. Shortly after their hike began, Liberty would make a post on Snapchat of Abigail walking on the bridge. Unfortunately, this would be the last communication anyone would receive from the girls. When they would fail to meet Liberty's father at their agreed designated location, their families would contact the authorities. This started a search that would lead to a heartbreaking discovery and a case that garnered national attention. Hello and welcome to Crime Corner with Jen. For those of you who don't know, my name is Jen and I talk about true crime cases on this channel. In this week's video, we're going to be talking about the case of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. We're going to be talking about how the case began and we'll also cover new updates and discoveries. Before we jump into this case, if you haven't already and you like my content, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and please be sure to hit the notification bell. This all really helps my channel to grow and is greatly appreciated. Now jumping right into things, as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, this case or this video is going to be about Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Abigail was born on June 23, 2003 in Lafayette, Indiana. She lived with her mother and stepfather and had a younger brother. Abigail was known for her love of animals and was described as a kind and caring person by those who knew her. She was a student at Delphi Community Middle School and was 14 years old at the time of her tragic passing. Liberty was born on December 27, 2002 in Lafayette, Indiana and was also enrolled in Delphi Community Middle School at the same time as Abigail. Liberty was 15 years old at the time of the tragedy. She lived with her grandparents who helped raise her as well as her father and siblings. She was known for her love of photography and was a talented artist. And both Abigail and Liberty were the best of friends who enjoyed spending time together in and outside of school. And on February 13th, 2017, the two girls would decide to go on a hike together on Monon High Bridge over Deer Creek in Delphi, Indiana. Delphi is a pretty small town with a population of about 2,900 people. It's what many people would consider a very sleepy town due to its small population and large network of parks and hiking trails. Abigail and Liberty were drawn to the natural beauty of Delphi due to its parks and hiking trails. The trails offered the perfect setting for a day out in nature. And as outdoor enthusiasts, they were always eager to explore and embark on new adventures in the great outdoors. So on that unusually warm February day at 1.35 p.m., Abigail and Liberty would be dropped off on County Road 300 North by Liberty's sister, Kelsey. The girls had agreed with Liberty's dad, Derek, that they would meet him at a designated location at 3 p.m. About an hour or so into their hike, Liberty would post a photo of Abigail on the bridge on her Snapchat. This would be the last post made by either of the girls during their hike. Now by 3 p.m., Derek was waiting at the designated location, waiting to pick the girls up, but Abigail and Liberty did not appear. He assumed at first that maybe Abigail and Liberty were just running a few minutes late and they were still walking over to the area. However, his concern began to grow as 3.15 rolled by and then 3.30 and the girls still did not arrive. He even tried to call Liberty and his first phone call went unanswered, but when he tried to call her a second time, the phone went straight to voicemail. Derek would call Abigail's family to let them know what was going on, and both families agreed that before calling the authorities, they would go out and try to find the girls themselves. They weren't too alarmed at this point because they figured that maybe the girls were just hanging out and had lost track of time. But when they followed the nature trail and found no trace of the girls, their concern began to grow. This would prompt the family to make a call to 911 at 5.30 p.m. Authorities would arrive to the nature trail and would search the trail and the surrounding areas, but were unable to find any trace of Abigail or Liberty. However, at this point, they did tell the families and news reporters that they didn't suspect any foul play. Their theory was that the girls may have walked off the trail and may have gotten lost in the woods, but that they would eventually find their way back. 
There were search parties out looking for both girls on the 13th, and the searches went well into the late evenings, with family members continuing the search well past midnight and into the early morning of the 14th. When the authorities and search parties came back to continue their search on the next day, which is February 14th, they would expand their search to beyond the bridge in Deer Creek. And just hours after the search began, two members of the search team would come across a horrific discovery. To their horror, they would find the bodies of Abigail and Liberty. The girls would be found around noon on that day, just half a mile east from the Monon Bridge and on a private piece of land in the woods. Authorities did not release the full details about how the girls had passed, and to this day, the full details of that have still not been released to the public. Although I have read reports of leaked messages from somebody in the search team claiming that the girls had been fatally stabbed. According to FBI documents, an agent did observe that some of one of the victim's clothing was absent and that the girls' bodies had been moved and arranged for display. The agent also speculated that a memento had been taken by the perpetrator and that killers often commemorate crime scenes through photographs. The FBI agent then stated that investigators did retrieve fibers and unidentified hairs from the location of the crime. And on February 15th, 2017, authorities would state that Liberty's phone had been recovered. And on Liberty's phone, law enforcement officials would find a video clip that they believe may have captured the potential killer. It's very hard to make out much about the man in the video because it's so short and the video is taken from quite a distance away from the girls, but you can see that he is a middle-aged white man. He's wearing a blue jacket and jeans and can be seen walking behind the girls and in their direction. Along with the image, they also found a recording on Liberty's phone where a man's voice could be heard saying, down the hill. Now, where the girls were at the time of this recording, there was in fact a hill. The hill leads down to Deer Creek and just a bit beyond that is where the bodies of the girls are found. So their location and what was being said in the recording, the voice saying down the hill, it does match up. About five months into the investigation, so about July 2017, the police would release a sketch of the suspect. This sketch was put together based on information received by a few witnesses who were hiking in the area on the day of the terrible crime. The man in the sketch would be described to be somewhere between 5'6 to 5'10 in height, with brownish hair and somewhere between 180 to 220 pounds. But even with this sketch, they still weren't able to pin down any solid leads. Now, on April 22nd, 2019, about two years later, the police would release a second sketch. This second sketch looks completely different from the first. With their new sketch released, the police would theorize that the man was anywhere between 18 to 40 years old. Now, what's interesting here is that both sketches were created based on information shared by witnesses who were hiking in the same area and on the same day as the two girls. Indiana police would surprise the public by telling everyone that the second sketch that was released in 2019 was actually the first sketch made when the investigation began. But after releasing the sketch in 2017, they would later decide in the investigation that the real first sketch released in 2019 was more accurate. Although they did mention that the real suspect could be a mix between the first and second sketches. Police also stated that they believed that whoever committed this crime was a local and was someone who was familiar with the Delphi area. The bridge that the girls and the suspect were on was pretty run down and the hills in the surrounding area were not easy to move around in. So they believed that whoever committed this crime was familiar with the bridge and the surrounding landscape. Because if they weren't, it would have made it very difficult for that person to have taken the girls, committed the horrible crime, and then to move their bodies. In 2019, shortly after releasing that second sketch, which turns out to be the real first sketch, the authorities would ask for the public's help to identify the driver of a vehicle that was parked 
in the same area on the day of the girl's disappearance. Unfortunately, because the authorities wouldn't share information about the vehicle, for example, what car it was, what model, what color, what make, the public didn't have much information to work with. And due to the lack of information shared with the public, the authorities pleas for help in identifying this vehicle or identifying the driver of this vehicle resulted in zero solid leads. To this day, the police have still been unable to identify who the driver is or who the owner of the vehicle is. In the initial phase of the investigation, and at some points later on as well, the authorities would begin to consider the owner of the land where the girls' bodies were found as a potential suspect. For over 50 years, Ronald Logan lived on County Road 300 North, near the trail to the Monon High Bridge. His home was searched, but no evidence was ever uncovered linking Logan to the murders. An FBI agent noted that the 77-year-old Ronald appeared to be in good physical condition and his voice was not inconsistent with the voice captured on Liberty's phone. The FBI also mentioned that text messages sent to and from Ronald's phone the evening of February 13, 2017, indicated that he was likely outside his home and in the proximity of where Liberty and Abigail's bodies were located. The agent specifically stated that they believed Ronald could be involved in the murders and made the following statements. I believe there is probable cause to believe that Ronald Logan has committed the crime of murder and evidence of that could be found on Ronald Logan's property. In an interview to 13 News around the time of the investigation, Ronald would make the following statement. People walk up and down with their, their children and yeah, it, it's, it's quite a nice little trail on the bridge. The area that they were in is very hard to get to. I mean, you, you, you can't get there unless you walk there. I mean, so somebody would be walking with them or something. The FBI really believed that Ronald was in some way involved in what happened to the girls, so they filed for a warrant to search his entire property. This search did not include just his home, but would extend to his garage and all surrounding areas on his private land. The police did not find concrete evidence linking Ronald to the crime, and he would pass away due to illness without ever being named an official suspect or without being linked to the murders. However, the police did find a number of red flags when investigating Ronald. The first one being that he had a number of weapons in his house, which violated his probation. Ronald was on probation due to being a habitual traffic violator, and he was also in trouble for driving while intoxicated. The second red flag here, which I find very interesting and very suspicious, is that Ronald had lied to the authorities about his alibi. Ronald had told the authorities that on February 13th, he had texted a friend and had asked his friend to take him to an aquarium store somewhere between 2 to 2.30 p.m. Ronald's friend had even backed up his story and had told the authorities that he did indeed go pick Ronald up around 2 to 2.30 p.m. that day. And this was told to the authorities sometime in March, but two days later, the friend would confess to lying for Ronald. His friend had claimed that Ronald had asked him to lie for him, and at the beginning, he didn't think that it would be an issue because Ronald's never asked him to lie about anything before, and he trusted Ronald, so he did what Ronald asked him to do. And now for the third flag. Cell phone tower data indicated that Ronald was in the same area as the two girls around the same time period on the afternoon of February 13th. Now, I agree that all of these points are very, very suspicious. Why was Ronald lying about his whereabouts? Why would he have reason to lie if he wasn't somehow involved in what happened to the girls? He was definitely hiding something, and I'm so surprised that 
he was never named a suspect, like as an official suspect, considering how suspicious his circumstances were. Now, police would later on name a man named Daniel Nations as an official suspect in the case. But on the one-year anniversary of the teen's deaths, they would hold a press conference stating that they no longer suspected Daniel to be involved in the murders. Instead, they were now interested in a man named Charles Andrew Eldridge. Charles was arrested for a completely different set of crimes not relating to the teen's disappearance, and I won't go into detail about what those crimes are because YouTube definitely won't allow it, and it's a very sensitive topic. All I'll say is that he was arrested for charges relating to SA. So when he was arrested by the Randolph County Police, the authorities there did contact the FBI to alert them of a potential link between Charles and the crime in Delphi. Charles actually seemed to be a match to the first sketch that the police released in 2017, but again, this discovery would lead to nowhere and Charles would be dismissed as a potential suspect. After losing interest in Charles, the police would name another suspect, a man by the name of Paul Etter. Paul was allegedly wanted for kidnapping and for SA. And again, I won't go into details about his crimes because they were pretty disturbing. Paul would then also meet a pretty gruesome ending after police had tried to arrest him and that arrest had led to a five-hour standoff. And again, just like the other suspects, in the end, Paul would end up being dismissed as a person of interest. So it seems like over the years, there were quite a few potential suspects or persons of interest. But none of those potential suspects led us to the answers that we are looking for. But that would all change at the end of 2022 when a man by the name of Richard Allen would come into the picture. On October 26, 2022, Richard Allen would be arrested and taken into custody. He would be charged with two counts of murder. Richard and his wife, Kathy Allen, lived in Whiteman Drive, which is a residential neighborhood in Delphi, Indiana. They've reportedly been living there since 2006, and their home is only two and a half miles away from the trail where the two girls' bodies would be discovered. Richard, aside from one speeding ticket, had a pretty clean criminal history and worked as a licensed pharmacy tech. At the time of the girl's deaths, Richard was working in a CVS in Delphi, Indiana, and Liberty's grandparents even recall him processing photos for them. Richard had given them his condolences and had allegedly refused to charge them for the photo processing. Now, Richard had been arrested after authorities had found a spent bullet at the crime of the scene that matched a weapon that belonged to Richard. And when news of his arrest went public, the whole town was shocked. Richard was described by his fellow townspeople as somebody who was very quiet, but seems like a normal enough guy. No one could have suspected that he would be the man behind these horrible crimes. Now, due to how high profile this case has become, authorities have tried their best to keep the full details of the investigation and the arrest a secret. I suspect that this is because the prosecutors believed that Richard was not working alone, so they wanted to ensure that all key evidence and information were kept out of the spotlight while they're still continuing their investigation. Richard's build is also similar to that of the man in the video. However, it's important to note here that while he is in custody, Richard has not yet been found guilty for the murders. In fact, to this day, Richard is still maintaining his innocence and claims that he has no idea how the bullets from his gun got to the crime scene. Richard did confess to being in the area on February 13th, putting him at the scene on the day of Liberty and Abigail's disappearance. So the evidence is pretty heavily stacked against Richard here. Richard did also release a public letter requesting the assistance of a public defender because due to his financial situation, he wasn't able to continue on to pay his legal fees. His letter would read, In the cause listed above, I, Richard M. Allen, hereby throw myself at the mercy of the court. I am begging to be provided with legal assistance in a public defender or whatever help is available. At my initial hearing on October 28th, 
2022, I asked to find representation for myself. However, at the time, I had no clue how expensive it would be just to talk to someone. I also did not realize what my wife and I's immediate financial situation was going to be. We have both been forced to immediately abandon employment, myself due to incarceration and my wife for her personal safety. She has had to abandon her house for her own safety. What little reserve there is will fail to even maintain the original residence. Again, I throw myself at the mercy of the court. Please provide me with whatever assistance you may. Thank you for your time in this most urgent matter. Sincerely, Richard M. Allen. Richard has been held in custody at the Indiana Department of Correction facility since November 2022. However, his attorneys did file for an emergency motion to have Richard transferred somewhere else due to the strict treatment he's receiving in his current facility. They cited that his current environment is causing him a great deal of stress that has led to, and I quote, a dramatic change in Mr. Allen's condition, including his change in demeanor, change in appearance, and change in his overall mental status. Law enforcement officials and the warden of the facility that Richard is being held in currently have even come forward to testify that they have not treated Richard any differently from any other inmates. They also stated that his current living arrangement is for his own protection. Because his alleged crimes would make him a target in the prison, law enforcement officials and the warden have decided to keep Richard isolated from other inmates to make sure that he doesn't get attacked. Now, during a hearing on June 15th, 2023, so just this month, both the defense attorney and the prosecutor have stated that Richard has made some incriminating statements while in prison. According to the prosecution, Richard has allegedly confessed to the murders six or seven times now. But according to the defense team, Richard's vague statements are inconsistent with Richard's previous statements of denial. The defense team have also stated that they're becoming increasingly worried about Richard's mental health and that both his physical and mental health have deteriorated significantly. When speaking with his lawyers, Richard would often repeat things multiple times and it seems like he's not fully there. His attorneys have even stated that they've had to reintroduce themselves to Richard on a few occasions now because his mental state has just deteriorated so significantly that he's forgetting who they are. This is actually one of the reasons that they're trying to get Richard moved to a different facility because they believe that his current facility is causing him so much stress that it's really having a huge impact on his health. However, because he's part of such a high profile case, no other facilities want to take him. Other facilities have come forward to state that it would be a burden on their staff and on their facility to take Richard in and it would still put Richard at a risk of getting attacked by other inmates. Another huge development from the June 15, 2023 hearing is that Richard's defense team is trying to file a motion to dismiss ballistic evidence, and this will be considered at a later date. Richard's current trial is set to begin on January 8th to January 26, in 2024. For the time being, investigators are remaining tight-lipped on this case, so we will need to wait for the trial and we will need to wait and see if any new information is released to the public. But for now, please do share your thoughts on what you think really happened here. Do you think Richard Allen is guilty? Or do you think he's been set up somehow and he's now confessing to his crimes in prison due to his deteriorating mental health? And do you think anyone else is involved in this horrific crime? Or do you think it was a one-man job? Please be sure to share your thoughts with me in the comments. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in to another video with me. I will try to keep a very close eye out on any new information regarding this case and if any new discoveries are shared, I'll perhaps make a shorter update video about this case because again, I also want to know what really happened and I would really like to see Abigail and Liberty receiving the justice that they so deserve. 
and hopefully with the trial coming up next year and the ongoing investigation there will be answers for their families and some closure so let's all stay tuned for that and thank you so much for watching this video guys i really appreciate it if you have any case recommendations please be sure to send them to my email here and i will see you in my next video have a really wonderful week ahead and take care bye